everybody and welcome to the CS230 Social Responsibility and Computing online lecture. This is lecture number one since we've transferred over to the online format instead of having the um, face-to-face -face courses. Um, so this will go on for a couple weeks and we'll see what happens. Um, if uh, restrictions get cleared, then we'll go back to the face-to-face -face classes. But in the meantime, what I'm going to do for you each week is record video for you and uh, have the lectures online. Um, so uh, this is the format that we're following. And uh, if you have any suggestions, comments, concerns, you can always send me an email message and I can take your suggestions under consideration. You know, something like, oh, I can't understand what you're saying, you're talking too fast, or the video quality is not good or something, or I don't know. I'm having problems finding the videos. Anything that you might want to, uh, want any, any suggestions for improvements, I'm totally open for this. I'm not in the practice of doing this, so I might actually even get better as we go through it. So what I want to do is kind of like uh, put a uh, touch base with everybody and kind of uh, make sure that uh, we're all good with what's going on. And uh, the second thing is if you uh, were not in class for the last class meeting, which was uh, last week, um, before we had like half the week off, um, I handed back the midterms and I went over the midterm answers in our last class meeting. If you missed that meeting, no problem. I have emailed, scanned and emailed everybody who missed it. Um, so you should have your exam if you did not receive your exam by email in a PDF file. Um, it means I probably have the wrong email address for you and you should send me an email and let me know. Um, unfortunately, I have already gone over the exam and so if you were not there and you got your exam by email and you have a question about something that you have missed, it's best to contact me personally. Um, and arrange a time uh, for us to speak about it either on the phone or by Zoom or some electronic means. I will not be on campus, obviously, for office hours, but I'm still holding office hours electronically. So I'll do it on a uh, appointment by appointment. So whenever you're available, uh, let me know. We can discuss your exam. Uh, the scores were quite good, so hopefully uh, there weren't an, uh, any concerns with that. So I want to go over the assignments and kind of touch base. Actually, before I do that, I want to sort of hit the syllabus real quick here. Uh, so in the syllabus, we uh, just had our midterm. And this week, uh, well, the week that just passed was Monday the 9th and the, the 311. This uh, was assignment number three that was due on 311, but you can have a seven day grace period on it. So it's really not really due for another week. This one was the one that was using Wireshark. I have already demonstrated Wireshark um, in one of the previous class meetings. Wireshark, if you remember, sniffs packets on the network. Um, so it shows you the traffic that's going back and forth between the router. I'll let you explore the interface. It's an ex one of those exploratory assignments. Uh, you can explore the interface and see um, how, how it works. And then if you can't get it to work, don't, don't worry about it. You're doing part two. Part two is the write-up, um, just like the previous two assignments. Um, you're researching and you're writing your thoughts on port scanning. And so that was the assignment that was due last week. I know that several people haven't turned it in yet. That's not a problem. You can have an extension. If you need two more weeks on it, that's fine too. Just turn it in when you can get it done. And so for this week coming up, uh, well, this week now, um, do this Wednesday, 318, is assignment number four. So my first priority in today's lecture is to go over assignment number four. The next thing I'm going to do is hit uh, chapter four, intellectual property. And we'll talk, because uh, that's where we left off. Uh, we, we talked about freedom of speech. Um, I already did... Uh, Ooh, I think we did work as well. Uh, we didn't hit intellectual property, so I want to talk about intellectual property today as well. Okay, if you have questions, comments, concerns, you should send me an email message and so I can uh, answer your questions. So the assignment that I'm going to go over right now is number four. Number four is due this week for the first time, and then you have a seven-day grace period, so you could do it uh, next week if you want. And pretty soon we'll have a spring break. I suspect we're going to be back in the classroom on Monday the 6th, but we'll see, April 6th. We'll see what happens. It depends on uh, what happens with this coronavirus and stuff like that, but uh, I don't know. I think we're only gonna be doing this for a couple weeks, but we'll see, um, so. 
All right, what is this assignment number four about? It's personal and professional code of ethics evaluation. So what you're gonna do, and the first thing you need to do is suggest an ethical scenario. Okay, I don't know how many of you have these ethical scenarios going on in your life. Uh, sometimes people have stuff they can pull from, other times, well, you just have to make it up. So a hypothetical, is one like your boss asked you to change the system to create more revenue in the near term, but it will cause the system to fail in the long run. Uh, you can make something up. Uh, don't go too elaborate, but sky's the limit. Um, so you're going to need to start out with either a personal one, a made up one, or maybe one they find in the news. Maybe there's something about the coronavirus out there that's an ethical scenario. Um, actually, it probably is at this point. Um, so pick an ethical scenario of your choice. The sky's the limit, anything you want. So what are you going to do? Number one, you're going to analyze the scenario using your own set of personal values. So to do this, you're going to have to identify the stakeholders in the scenario, all of the actions that were taken, and all of the alternative actions that could have been taken. <clears throat> and uh, you're to state your reactions and actions and decisions. How would you, how would you frame it? How, what are your own personal views on it? And then the next thing you're going to do is you're going to analyze it per the ACM Code of Ethics, Code of Professional Conduct. And so this URL will take you to the ACM Code of Ethics, stating the specific principles from the code that apply to the scenario and what the right course of actions are based upon from the scenario. It might agree with what you have suggested and it might not. So, <clears throat> excuse me, um, the outcome doesn't matter. So you don't have to, your personal perspective doesn't have to match what the ACM code of ethics um, perspective is. They can be totally different. Your paper should be a minimum of two pages double spaced, which is really one page single spaced. Don't use charts, codes, or graphics in the write-up. If you wanted to do a half a page on you and your opinion and a half a page on what the code of ethics say to do, uh, that works. Or maybe it's all about you and three fourths of the page is about your opinion. And maybe the code of ethics doesn't say anything about it. And maybe your conclusion is I looked at the code of ethics and there's nothing in here that actually um, applies towards what should be done in this particular case, um, which might actually be the case in some scenarios. I try to pick a scenario that has a computer component to it where the code of ethics would apply. You know, for, um, should, uh, I mean, if you pick a coronavirus theme, it may or may not apply towards computer technology. It's hard to tell. Um, so see, uh, you know, maybe there's, I don't know, I can twist something out of that, but probably not. Um, okay. If you have questions about the assignment, uh, go ahead and email them to me. I'm going to assume I can ask, is there any questions? And you, no one's going to respond right now because you can't. Uh, but I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking it's pretty straightforward. The only questions I've had so far on email is, uh, does it have to be a real scenario? And the answer to that is no. And uh, you can pick it on anything you want. It doesn't have to be real. It doesn't have to be something that happened to you. You could just find something in the new news media that is of interest to you. If you want to write it single page, then it's one page single spaced. It's two pages double spaced. Send it along to me with assignment number four on the subject line, just like the previous assignments. Nothing has changed when it comes to the assignment submissions. It's the uh, same process as before. All right. So now what I'm going to do is starting with the lecture. The today's lecture is on intellectual property. It is chapter four from the lectures folder. And we're going to be talking about, I'm going to be talking about intellectual property. Uh, so you don't need that one. So here we go. All right. <clears throat> this is from the Get to Fire, Intellectual Property. Now, obviously, you should probably read Chapter 4. It's, uh, I'm not going to give you everything that there is in Chapter 4, but this is going to be a pretty good summary. Um, so intellectual property is property that is not physical property. Physical property would be like a book or a computer or a car. And we all know about the laws and rules that are associated with physical property. If you steal somebody's car, you're probably going to get arrested. If you steal somebody's book, if it's a physical book, you're probably going to be arrested. But if you plagiarize from the book, 
you steal what's in the book, but you don't actually take the physical book, then you've taken intellectual property and you have still stolen something. You took something that wasn't yours and treated it like it was yours. Uh, so you've still broken the law, but most people don't see it that way. It's like when they download content from the internet that is copy protected, do you really think that you've like broken a law? Uh, or did you just take something and downloaded something that you found on the internet? Um, so there's a lot of gray area with that. Uh, what we're gonna cover is the uh, changing technology and how technology is making intellectual property uh, more, more possible, uh, the violation of it more possible. Uh, copyright law, significant cases associated with it, copying and sharing, search engines, online libraries, free speech issues, free software, and the issues for software developers. So as mentioned before, intellectual property is creative work. It's not particularly a physical form. It could be a painting, a drawing, a poem. Um, the value of the intellectual artistic work comes from creativity, ideas, research, skills, labor, non-material efforts. Um, okay, so protected by copyright and patent laws. All right, so I don't expect anyone in this class to actually be familiar with patent laws or copyright laws. Uh, I can give you a nutshell version, uh, kind of a description of what these three, and there's three components, really. There's copyright patent and then there's trademarks or you know um yeah trademarks actually is the most popular one so let's start with trademarks actually so i'm going to talk a little bit off the slides right now i'm going to come back to it um really what i'm talking about is what is intellectual property so i'll stay on this slide let's talk about trademarks mm -hmm. so we all know that the apple symbol is a trademark or if we don't the apple symbol is a trademark you know it's like this like um, shape of an apple, looks like an apple, it has a funny little thing on the top of it. And uh, the Microsoft logo, I can't remember what that actually looks like right now. Um, there's a Coca-Cola logo. Those are, so trademarks are generally words or logos. So if you have a picture of something, a logo, that's a trademark and it's registered, which is why they call it a registered trademark. So Apple went ahead and registered this picture of the Apple and said, this is our logo. We're going to use this on all of our products and we're going to protect it because this is, this trademark is going to identify us as a company. It's Apple computers. And they also trademarked the I. So iPhone, iPad, I, whatever is also a trademark. So, uh, what is it? Nike, the Nike trademark. And then there's a, um, just do it. Is that Nike? I don't know. There's a, there's a phrase that says, just do it. I think that's Nike. Um, that's a trademark. Um, Coca-Cola, it feels good. That's a trademark. Um, where's the beef? Actually, that's a trademark from Wendy's. Where's the beef? So these are not one words. There's like expressions can be trademarked. Um, slogans can be trademarked. Pictures can be trademarked. So it usually protects products and services, and it's usually owned by companies who register a trademark to say, this is how we're doing business. This identifies us. <clears throat> so what does that do? It protects the company from fraud. So, I mean, we've all probably seen the knockoffs um, <coughs> where it's, you know, not really Nike, it's bikey or something, or uh, Nike or Mikey. I don't know, you know, they change a the character in there, but they're trying to sound like they're Nike or Adidas. Um, I can't think of them, but there are actually some cool pictures and some funny stuff on the internet if you search the knockoff brands. Um, those are against the law. Knockoffs are against the law because they're infringing upon the trademark rights by imitating or impersonating another trademark. Some people actually just use the full trademark. I mean, that's 100% impersonation. Um, so the law is supposed to be protecting the company against people doing that stuff. So people are not supposed to be doing that stuff. All right, those are trademarks. A patent. A patent is an invention. There's two forms of inventions. There's designs and then there's utilities. So if I invent something like a chair, 
Ooh, there we go. Um, the concept of the chair, there's actually a patent on a chair, believe it or not. There's a four-legged and there's a three-legged chair. Um, I don't know who would buy a three-legged one, but there's a patent on it. Um, and it is the utility patent of a device that you can sit on that supports you. Sometimes it supports your back, sometimes it just supports your legs, but it's a supporting device. There's a patent on a mouse. There's a patent on a computer, actually. Um, in fact, my, uh, Apple's got the patent on their board. Um, the patent uh, protects the invention and from people copying it. That patents are usually done on products and devices. Um, they're in the form of an invention. So somebody invented the amplifier, the speaker. Somebody invented the flooring, laminate flooring. Somebody invented uh, uh, fluorescent lights, uh, shutters. Uh, you just look around the world, whatever you're looking at has a patent on it. Um, and it protects the patent holder from the utility of the patent. Okay, so there's also a thing called the design patent. So a utility is something that you use as a product. A design is something that um, is found usually in fabric or in paint or in some sort of a logo. Um, you can patent a logo, actually, um, depending upon what's in it. A common design patent would be argyle. Um, uh, I don't even know what argyle means, but argyle socks, you know, it's a pattern. Um, Burberry's got one for some color-coded stitchwork pattern uh, that they have on their products. Um, there's denim. Denim is a design patent. Um, you know, the concept of blue jeans, denim. Um, corduroy is a, is a design patent. Um, it's kind of a raised corduroy fuzz kind of thing. Um, texturing that you put on walls. Um, that's a design patent. A leather, ooh, leather, fi leather finishes are patented. The leather itself can't be patented. It's not an invention of mankind. It's a, something that came from an animal. It's animal skin. It's, it's not something that humans invented. So inventions that human invented are patents. Uh, drugs are patented as well. There's drugs uh, that fall into drug patents. Um, pharmaceuticals are patented. Okay, so then it leads us to the last one, which is copyright. Copyright is in the last last category here is anything written. So software is written. It doesn't mean handwritten. You can type it as well or punch it into a keyboard. Um, that stuff is copy protected. So believe it or not, source code is copy protected. Writing a book is copy protected. A poem, a song, um, a screenplay, uh, anything that can be written on a piece of paper or written on a computer, um, is copy protected. Now the copyright office does the copy protection. And you might be familiar with uh, some of the open source or creative commons protection. And you can still protect copy protection if, you know, for public and for common use, which is what Creative Commons does. Um, but most of the copy protection is done to protect the rights of the original creator to give credit where credit is due. There's not usually a monetary thing like there is with a patent. So if I do a patent, I'm looking to, you know, sell licenses to my patent. Anyone who wants to make a chair has to, you know, pay me a royalty on my patent for chairs. Um, if I have a logo, nobody can use it but me because I'm Apple Computers and it's my logo. But copy protection, everybody uses it. But the credit goes to the copy protected owner. So if I wrote this poem, I said this, this famous speech and it's copy protected, then if someone repeats my speech, they're supposed to say, and Barbara Hecker said that, you know, and this belongs to her. So when you write a research paper, you're supposed to do that too. You're supposed to, when you find work on the internet, you find stuff in books, it's copy protected. So you say, you know, you put quotations around it. You say, Bob said in 1993 that the computer was a waste of time. Uh, and then you put the author's last name, comma, the year, and you put it in a reference list. It's, it's because it's copy protected. 
That's why you're doing that. And if you don't do that, then you're a victim or you're, you're committing what's called plagiarism. Plagiarism is when you take somebody else's copy protected work and you make it your own. People plagiarize music all the time. Students plagiarize research papers all the time. You're constantly stealing things that don't belong to you and claiming that you said it or you did it. That's plagiarism. Now, fair trade practices are violated with um, knockoffs, uh, imitations, and trademark violations. Patent inventions, nothing usually happens with a patent violation. The only thing that really happens is the company that owns the patent is going to come back and collect all the money from you, and you end up losing money. So that's a revenue-generating stream on the patent end. It's a art and fame on the copyright end, and it's a don't mimic our business and don't compete against us on the trademark end. So you can take an entire course in this. Um, that's kind of the nutshell version of what intellectual property means. Um, so let's see what else we got in the lecture here. So, and I talked ahead on some of these things. So, um, so copyright holders. Um, so copyright holders have exclusive rights to make their own copies. Now, there are some things that you can do, and you're going to see this in the next assignment, actually. So creative works are great. Just because someone, you know, wrote this song and there's a famous line in the song doesn't mean you can't use that famous line as long as it's just that line and not the whole thing. So educators um, often find books and things online and Authors make copy protected material available online and what ends up happening is that there's a there's a common agreed upon standard um, that's actually part of the law that says you can use one complete chapter out of a book. You can copy one complete chapter out of a book and, and that's okay as long as you don't do more than one chapter. So if you do that you can make copies of one chapter out of each book uh, that you find that's copy protected and that's okay. So you can, you know, you can't produce uh, derived works, translations in other languages and stuff. That's, that's not right. Or distribute copies. When I think of distributing copies, uh, for example, like of movies and things, I always think about that Seinfeld episode where Kramer goes into a movie theater and records the movie with a video camera. He sits in the front row. It's actually hilarious. Sits in the front row and records the movie. And then he starts selling the movie. That's copyright infringement. And you can't like make a copy, a digitally composed copy of the Mona Lisa, for example, and sell it as the Mona Lisa. That's copy infringement. So, <clears throat> so challenges with new technology. Um, so unless you just crawled out from under a rock and you don't know about the internet, um, well, some people haven't, but uh, they're, they're still hiding under the rock from the coronavirus. Um, so, well, crawl out from under it, and then you'll notice that there's a bunch of digital technology out there and all that stuff makes it easier and easier and easier and cheaper to do stuff. In fact, when uh, audio files and video files and DVDs first started coming out in digital form, they were all over the internet. People go, you know, to you know, downloadmovies.com or whatever it's called, and you, you know, oh, I like this movie. Oh, I like that movie, and you just download whatever you want. Well, that's against the law. That's illegal. Um, it was promoted by technology, and people were just ignorant, I believe, uh, in terms of like what is allowable and what's not allowable. I'm going to try and give them credit and just call them ignorant. Otherwise, then they're deliberately breaking the law and violating people's rights. But new compression technology makes it easier, makes the, the files smaller, makes them easier to download. Uh, new tools allow us to modify graphics, videos, uh, scanners allow us to change the media, um, convert, uh, converting text, photos, and everything into electronic form and making it more readily available. So some questions to think about, you know, is how is this property like physical property, you know, and because I stole a song off of the internet, is it the same as stealing somebody's bicycle? Mm, kind of. And how is intellectual property different from physical property? Well, yeah. And uh, do you agree with the idea that someone can own intellectual property? Well, that's an interesting question. Actually, now that I've gone through all three forms of intellectual property, I hope you see that people can own that. Like Apple owns the Apple logo. And uh, 
you write your you write a nice essay you own the essay that's your essay um, you should be able to own it you know just because it's not physical doesn't mean it doesn't exist so all right lucky for you i'm not a history buff you do not have to know anything about the history you don't have to know anything about any of the laws or anything it is kind of interesting to see that was, we had this back in 1790 the first copy protected law was passed now that's an interesting one um in 1992, making multiple copies of commercial advantage and private gain became a felony. Well, that's uh, before the year 2000, so. And then a fair use doctrine came out in the late 80s, and that was significant as well. But uh, if you go through the historical timeline, you can sort of see how things have changed over the years. Um, but for the most part, you don't have to remember the dates or any of the historically significant events. Um, so we, uh, the Digital Millennium Copy were protected. The DMCA was actually, you'll, you're going to look at this in one of the assignments coming up. And the as content of the assignment is what you probably should know about. You'll be looking at YouTube. You'll be looking at uh, the Digital Millennium Copy, Copyright Act and some of the um, more current things associated with um, what you can and cannot do with digital media. And uh, there's fines, there's penalties associated with uh, copy protection. Um, I don't know if you guys remember Sony back in the day that was doing um, digital signatures or digital protection on their discs, um, and they've been removed. So we, we've gone through some trials and tribulations of different experiments with different things over the, over the years, but uh, for the most part, people stopped encrypting and stopped kind of making it impossible for someone to steal it because it's not impossible technology has gotten to the point where nothing everything is possible nothing's impossible yet so one of the things you do want to know about is the fair use doctrine there's four factors to consider and this is part of one of the assignments that's coming up and i'll probably talk about it in the next video actually because it's going to be the next assignment according to the fair use doctrine <clears throat> there's four factors to consider the purpose and the nature of the use um, is it commercial less likely for nonprofit purposes, maybe. The nature of the copy protected work, the amount of significance or portion used, and then the effects of the use of, uh, on the market or the value of the copy. So we'll reduce this, we'll reduce sales, will it take uh, the sale of the work, will it, will it take credit away from the, from the user? In fact, I'm gonna go ahead and switch to that assignment because I know it's, it's coming up in your, uh, in your list. Uh, so let's see. Uh, I want to say that it is assignment number five. Let's just take a look here. Yep, it is. Okay, so I'm going to talk about assignment number five as well. And believe it or not, this is the same kind of thinking I would do in a live class lecture as well. Um, because I see the material and I'm like, yeah, it's relevant to one of your assignments. So you should be working on four right now. But coming up, you're going to have five soon and uh, five is in is called copyright and fair use so in here you're going to have two scenarios uh, hypotheticals hypothetical one and then hypothetical two you're going to read through the hypotheticals and what's going to happen is you're going to go to and look at this fair use policy that i'm talking about and consider the four elements that the courts use to determine whether or not an infringement has occurred and you're going to find it at the Stanford site because it's easier. So if I uh, click on this guy here and go to the Stanford site, fair use at Stanford. You see, those are, I just showed you in the lecture, the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the copy protected work, the amount and substantially of the portion taken, the effects of it. So it's a, it's kind of a lit, well, it's kind of a test that you're going to go through to say, um, you know, how much did you use of it? What was the purpose of it? What was the gain from it? Um, apply the four elements that the court would apply. And then you're gonna answer, these, uh, answer this scenario and provide a general discussion of your thoughts and perspectives in one or two pages. This is double-spaced. So this can be um, you know, one page single space, two page double space. Articulate your inter interpretation of the laws and the principles and clarify. You know, you're going to pretend like you're an attorney, but you're not, you know, like I'm not expecting any professional legal advice here. So 
this is an ethics class, not a law class, so I'm not expecting you to respond like a lawyer or a judge, but you can pretend to be one if you wish. So you're going to read through the scenario, and then you're going to answer the questions related to it. It's like, number one, you know, assess Rita Espinosa's argument that her in inclusion of Tito Puente's music in her video is a fair use. Is that a legitimate claim? What evidence might she use to back her claim? And consider the four elements the court would use to determine when her infringement had occurred. And then you're going to discuss the YouTube agreement for the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And then at the end, you're going to say, well, is she going to be successful? And what she's going to do is she's, this whole thing, she's, she's created this five-minute video and uploaded it to YouTube. And the video contains some of this Latin jazz musician's uh, material. And so the whole scenario is going to describe it, what she did, and then you're going to determine if it was fair use or not. And so you're going to be able to apply some of these principles, and both of the scenarios kind of work the same way. You're doing the same thing in both scenarios. You're applying the principles, and then you're, you're going to look at it and say, you know, what could be done differently? Did the person, whatever the person did, was it correct? Was it not correct? How can they change it? Would the, would the law favor her or, or would they favor the original owner of the work? So that's pretty much what's happening with this. And you might want to, you know, work on assignment number five because it kind of goes along with uh, today's lecture. But uh, I mean, it, it is definitely, uh, definitely relevant. Um, so, so that's the Fair Use Doctrine. And the Fair Use Doctrine is the, the site. Um, it's republished on the Stanford site and, uh, it's basically breaking things down into those four factors and it's considering the purpose and the nature of the use. Was it commercial use? Was it private use? Like for example, I used um, a, a poem that I found in a book and I did it uh, for nonprofit purposes. Yeah, it's probably going to be okay. Um, or I did it for sale. I sold the poem. Probably not okay. The nature of the copyrighted work, well, it's a poem. So... It's kind of like, you know, if it was the happy birthday song, which is copy protected, happy birthday is copy protected, but everybody uses it. So the nature of the work meant, you know, it became the birthday song. Who doesn't sing the song? Do I have to pay royalties every time I sing the song? Who doesn't say the song for somebody's birthday? Also the amount of significance or the portion used. So in one of those hypotheticals, she only used like a two second clip of the Latin music, you know? She didn't repeat the entire song. She only played like a little bit of it. And maybe that little bit of it wasn't really that significant. And then what effect did it have on the market? Did it like, no, 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 people don't want to buy this Latin guy's music anymore because they heard it from her. Now, if one of these things outweighs the other, like the effect of the use on the potential market, and let's say it destroys sales or something, that might be a problem. That might actually end up, uh, you know, making it illegal for her to use this information. Um, or, you know, like if I, um, I think there was a case with the Adidas logo, actually, where someone used the Adidas logo, used something about Adidas and did something and it like ruined um, like an entire model of shoes or something. It was really bad. And the effects of the potential market and the value, well, it reduced the sales of, um, and so they were asked to take that thing off the market. You know, you can't do that. So no single factor alone determines everything. Not all factors give equal weight, and it varies by the situation and circumstances. Obviously, if you're going to cause harm, you're not going to be allowed to do it. So some significant cases, and again, you don't need to know about the significant cases, would have been like Sony versus Universal Studios back in 1984. Um, Making devices with legitimate uses should not be penalized because some people may not use it to infringe a copyright, which meant, okay, so in the beginning, Sony made drives where you could copy CD. You know, when the technology became available and you could actually duplicate a CD-ROM um, or a DVD disc, um, you know, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow. Uh, I and mean, just because you can do it doesn't make it right, like you should do it. You know, as a classic example, um, lots of these laser color printers that we have today, you could actually make your own money. I mean, you could make a hologram on it. You can do like duplicate money, but just because you can do it doesn't necessarily mean that 
it's legal. Um, it's not legal to reproduce money. In fact, even if you photocopy money, you're going to get in trouble. Uh, but people do it, actually, uh, because the technology is there and, and technology will allow you to do it. Uh, people also reduplicate uh, diplomas. They make fake documents. Um, yeah, the technology is there. Um, so the Supreme Court decided that copying mo movies for later viewing was fair use. And uh, so was downloading stuff from the Internet because you wanted to use it later and it belonged to you. That was fair use. So the arguments against fair use, people copied the entire work and movies are creative, not uh, factual. So, yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, the copy, if you're making copies for private, non-commercial use, that was okay. The movies... Uh, studios could not demonstrate that they suffered any harm. It's kind of like, can we make a copy of something? Um, for example, if you copied your book because you didn't want to lose the book, or you bought a copy of the book and you made a photocopy of the book, as long as you keep that photocopy, you're not giving it to somebody else, it's okay. So the same thing applies towards the DVD. So, so anyway, uh, reverse engineering, um, game me machines, um, came up a, a lot, Atari games, there was some Nintendo games, there were some issues with the game concepts and what was happening in the games. Courts ruled that reverse engineering does not violate copy protection if the intention is to make new creative works or video games, not copy the original work of the gaming system. So what ended up happening was between Atari and Nintendo, um, Nintendo was uh, being accused with copying Atari games which is actually funny because you can get old classic Atari games now on Nintendo systems, which is actually kind of funny. Uh, but the games themselves, you know, like Super Mario and stuff like that, I don't even know who owns what now. Um, they were coming up with, you know, and they were saying that that's reverse engineering, but they didn't reverse engineer it to reproduce the game. They reverse engineered it so that they could figure out how to make something equivalent to it. Um, so that wasn't copy protected. So sharing music, we all heard about Napster back in the day. Uh, was the sharing of music via Napster fair use? Not really. Um, Napster's argument for fair use, the Sony decision allowed the entertainment use to be considered fair use. It didn't hurt the industry sales because users sampled the music on Napster and bought the CD if they liked it originally. So uh, Napster is actually kind of a funny case because there was a point where, um, you know, it was, you know, peer to peer file sharing and then they determined that it was wrong. They made a high profile case with several, you know, several millions of dollars for some parents. And then they reversed the ruling. They overturned it. Um, uh, so they, and they said, oh, you didn't do anything wrong. And they give all the money back, but they didn't publicize that, so nobody really figured that out. And then uh, Napster is still around. Napster is uh, still in use today. Uh, slightly different uh, business, but it's still around. And um, so, Recording Industry Association of America argued against the fair use. The personal method is very limited, not trading with thousands of strangers, and that songs and music and creative works. Or copying whole songs was not right. Claimed Napster severely hurt sales. Court ruled sharing music and MP3 files violated copyright protection. But then they turned around and reversed it. Um, was Napster responsible for the actions of the users? Not really. Napster's argument was that it was the same as a search engine, which is protected by the DMCA. So in a search engine, and I told you guys this in class, if you're using a search engine and you are searching for, let's say, a book or a song or something, and uh, you happen to find it, and it's not, it's violating copy protection, like somebody put it up there illegally, and you're looking at it through a search engine or through a search brow a web browser, you're not doing anything wrong. It's protected under D DMCA, which is Digital Rights Management, which is you don't have the responsibility as a user searching through a search engine. You're not taking responsibility for the person who illegally put the content up there. That's not your fault. So as long as you're looking at it through the search engine, through the web browser, and that's how you found it, then you're not doing anything wrong. You can look at all of the illegal content, listen to all the music that you'd like through anything, and you're not breaking any laws. And you're not storing any of the MP3 files. So... 
you know, as soon as you download it and as soon as you store the stolen content on your computer, then you're breaking the law. <clears throat> so, all right, we've already kind of sort of gone through some of this in the class already. So I'm going to sort of skip through it a little bit here. And you don't need to know all of these particular cases. You can read through the book and it'll tell you a lot of the different um, case studies that have been done, some of the rulings with peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Um, so what do you think the impact would be on creative industries such as music, movies, and, f and uh, fiction novels if copy laws didn't protect their intellectual property? Well, that's a very good question. It's happening right now, actually. And you know what my own personal take on this is? Artists are still making music. Artists are still writing books. They're still creating movies. But you know what? The cost of going to a movie has significantly raised, has been raised. Um, the cost of concerts, ridiculously high right now. Um, and then part of it's due to the fact that that's, they have to make their money somewhere. If you can't make your money on the music sales, then you make your money on the concert sales. So, Ideas for the software industry. Um, I'm sure, you know, unless you just crawled out from under a rock, you've, uh, you've installed software before on your computer. You have uh, taken and, uh, you know, you've, you've uh, registered, hopefully, uh, programs and you've downloaded software. Some of them have expiration dates. Some of them use dongles. Some of them use uh, copy protection. It prevents copying, activation codes. Um, I like the route that Microsoft's taking right now with subscription-based services. So it'll just check online to see if your year is up yet on your Microsoft Office 365. And if it is up, then you'll have to pay for it again to register it for another year. I don't know if I like that part, but I do like the fact that it, um, they are checking. So... But yeah, software companies, they have to be creative these days um, in order to protect their software from being illegally reproduced. So uh, banning, suing, taxing, uh, these are, you know, copy of CD recording devices, digital audio tapes, DVD players, portable. These are all technologies used in the content industry and uh, required new technology, include copy protections. So. You could tax the digital media to compensate for the industry's unexpected losses. There is a tax, actually. There's a music license. Um, so if you own a restaurant or a bar and you're playing uh, the football game or you're uh, broadcasting music or casting music um, or even showing the TV, for that matter, um, if it's a digital cable service, uh, you have to pay a license. Um, so you actually have to pay for public use of this um, so digital rights management is, uh, by definition, this is the collective uh, controls used to control the intellectual property, uh, includes hardware, software, and this is the DRM that I was talking about with Sony. I believe Apple did it too. Apple had uh, originally the iTunes, you could only download the songs on three computers, and then that went out the window. People went, how come just three computers? or three devices and then uh, you know if you think about it if you buy a new device every year uh, after three years you're going to replace all your music uh, that's not right and so they lifted that they took that away um, nobody's really using uh, the DRM these days it's pretty much gone but for a moment in, in time people try to protect things using DRM so so we don't have to know about all these law, all these cases and all of this stuff for the Supreme Court either um, video sharing, conflict and solutions, um, the takedown notices for DCMA, and you'll see this with YouTube. So as long as sites like a YouTube, MySpace, ooh, MySpace is still around, I uh, probably just put Facebook in there, comply with takedown notices, they're not in violation. Uh, so the takedown notices, okay, we know your users are going to put some stuff up there. And if we tell you to take it down, you must take it down within 24 or 48 hours. And as long as YouTube does that, then they're okay. Because you can't predict what users are going to do. Users will go to a concert, they'll record it, they'll put it up on YouTube, it'll sit up there for about 12 hours or so, and then someone was going to notice it and go, hey, you're not supposed to do that. That's my copy protected material. And then they tell YouTube, we'll take it down. And then YouTube will go through and take it down. Will they catch them all? No. Do they always catch them? I mean, are some of them still up there? Yeah. Some of them stay up there longer than others. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's not foolproof. But uh, it is a, there's a takedown policy, and you'll read about that when you go through assignment number five as well. All right, new business models and new constructive solutions. 
Um, it's kind of like what Netflix did, actually. Um, Netflix has got a pretty good model. Netflix, you can stream as much as you want, as many times as you want, but you never download it. Um, and the technology of the streaming is done so you can't download it. So it's not like the old days where you got a DVD in the mail. Well, you can still do that, actually. But uh, you got a DVD in the mail, and you made a copy of the DVD and returned the original, and then you kept the movie. Um, that's uh, kind of iffy these days. Uh, but uh, the online streaming programs are designed, and the, like the Roku channels and the digital content streaming services don't allow you to copy, which is good. Sites such as iTunes and the new Napster provide legal means for obtaining inexpensive music and generating revenue as well. So technology has improved. So the new business model... Uh, has constructive solutions, embeds advertising in files. Um, you know, fan fiction is generally not seen as a threat. The writers are off, also the customers for the original works usually. So, so ethical arguments about copying, unlike physical property, copying, distributing a song, video, computer program, doesn't decrease the use or the enjoyment by another person, although it t- could degrade the quality. Copying can decrease the economic value of the creative work produced for sale. So the fair use guidelines are used uh, useful for ethical guidelines associated with that. And who knows, maybe for the assignment number four, you'll pick a copy protected issue um, for your ethical um, scenario. So many arguments for and against unauthorized copying, by the way. So. <clears throat> International piracy. All right, so I'm sure that we've all gone and looked for textbooks and seen the international version. Um, And then you're noticing the international version is $5, and it doesn't look the same. It's printed out on 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper. looks like it's photocopied, actually. So here's what happens. The the intellectual property laws go by by country-by-country. There's no such thing as an international protection for anybody. Uh, like the UK doesn't have it, EU doesn't have it, the United States doesn't have it. There's no such thing as like global protection. Um, so there, there's laws in different countries. So our laws in the United States say that you can't take a book and photocopy it and resell the copies. But the international laws say you they don't have you can't you can do that. There's no protection against that. So what ends up happening is people take the book and they make it the international version by taking it out of the country, photocopying it, and then bringing the photocopies into the country and selling them here. Um, When in reality, they're really making them here. They're not really taking them out, bringing them back in. But they call them the international versions for that reason. Because, oh, we just made it internationally. Um, So it's not quite legal. It's not legal. Uh, And it's kind of a scam, actually. And when you buy an international version of a textbook, you're not giving any money to the original creator of the textbook. You're giving it to people who are making a fraud for a living. So countries have a high piracy rate, often do not have a significant software industry. That is true. Many countries that have a high amount of piracy are exporting the pirated copies to countries with strict copyright laws. Yeah. Exactly what I was talking about. Um, so, all right. So, economic sanctions are often penalize legitimate businesses, not those that seek to target. So, yeah, for a while there, the government was blocking DVD content and uh, printed materials crossing the border. So, even companies making legitimate things would get stuck until they just dropped everything. So... Some have argued that copy lawsuits, copyright lawsuits have been used to stifle innovation. Do you agree? Why or why not? I don't know if they really have stifled innovation. I think they may have. Um, in fact, that's kind of a discussion question for you to think about, I guess. Um, have people stopped inventing things because they can't get paid for it anymore? Um, well, just take a look at the music artists. Do we see the artists not making new songs or records anymore? Um, no, I think they're all still trying to be famous and they're all still trying to make, they're just trying to get money in different ways. But you can argue that sometimes it does stifle innovation, stops, stops progress. Search engines. 
All right, and uh, online libraries. Well, online libraries are good. Those are legitimate sources of information. Search engines, <clears throat> you get the global open free market, which is not always copy protected. Caching, displaying small experts, uh, excerpts is fair use. Creating and displaying thumbnails of images is fair use. The court ordered that Google to remove links to pages that infringed copyright. Google's appealing. Well, yeah. Okay, so we are, I mean, maybe we've all heard of, or maybe we've all seen of Google Images. The court system is also trying to stop Google Images as well. So if you just type in Google Images or just click on the Images button, you see a bunch of images. Well, most of them are copy protected, but people don't know that. So Google is just a search engine. It'll search for engine uh, images and show you a list of images on the screen. And the user will use those images. But are those images copy protected? Yes. Are they allowed to use them? No, they're not allowed to use them. But Google makes them available. So you can argue the same thing about the search engine and say, well, I typed in the name of my textbook and the search engine gave me a link to a PDF of the textbook that's copy protected. <clears throat> Is it Google's fault? Eh, I don't know. So they're still in battle with copyright issues and whether or not they should be allowed to show you protected content. Uh, there's also a bunch of books online. Um, digitizing public domain. So Microsoft scanned millions of public domain books for University of California Library. Google scanned millions of books. And I'm sure you've seen the Google Books on there too. Uh, they display only experts, uh, excerpts, can't say that word, from still copy protected material. And if you notice, some of those Google Books actually show the whole thing. Uh, but they're only supposed to be showing one chapter. They're not supposed to be showing everything. Uh, but there was a little controversy there with, you know, should the books be digitized and should the books be available online even with that limited uh, domain or limit, limited excer excerpts out of it. And yeah, that's okay. Um, it's following fair use. So, but people don't understand that that's fair use. Uh, in fact, some book companies have given permission, especially for older versions of the book, to release it. So, domain names. Domain names have been used to criticize or to protest. You know, XYZ is junk.org. Companies sue under the trademark violation, but in most cases are dismissed. You know, it's, um, I don't know, I don't recommend doing this, but I think if you go to www.thewhitehouse.com, I think it's a porn site. Because uh, people think, you know, whitehouse.org is the White House from the government. Um, but... Anyway, long story short, they've taken the name and if you accidentally misspell it or you mistype it, it takes you to something that you don't necessarily want to go to. Um, so some companies buy uh, numerous domain names containing their names so that others cannot use them and then they turn around and sell it. So yeah, that, I think that's against, that, that's, that's kind of unethical, but it's not illegal. You can buy like www.apple.com if you wanted to, if it were available. Um, or, you know, any business name that you want that happens to be available. You don't actually have to be the business owner. And there's an assumption that there's, because that's the name of your business, that that's your domain name, that you should have that. No, other people buy it and then they sell it to you. They hold it as ransom and they sell it to you because you want to use it. Um, so... Posting documents for criticism, documents that are copy protected, trade secrets have been posted as a form of criticism. So, yeah. Um, yeah, organizations have sued to have documents removed from the web. In some cases, the courts have ruled that it's a copy violation and documents must be removed. In other cases, it's like, no. So the judgment against the Church of Scientology, the court ruled that the church's primarily motivation was to stifle criticism and of the Scientology. So, yeah. It's like, you know, why would you want something bad about that written? So, have everything removed that's bad and then knowing the stuff that you want out there is good. Free software. Wow. Idea, an ethic, advocate, support a large, loose-knit group of computer programmers who allow people to copy, use, and modify their software. Yeah, there is. There's free software out there. There's free means. Uh, Free means freedom of use, not necessarily lack of cost, but free. There's also open source, which is distributed in open source. Open source is not free, by the way. 
open source is a limited license. It's like Creative Commons or open source books and things, uh, primarily software that you can contribute to and that there's a distribution or license to it that doesn't cost anything, but you can't commercialize it. And then there's proprietary software, or commercial software. Um, so those are the software kind of categories. Should all software be free? I don't know. Uh, that's another controversial question. Um, well, would there be incentives for people to produce huge quantities of consumer software? It's just like apps. Should all apps be free? Um, you know, they've made it to the point where they almost are. I mean, there's a dollar, two dollars, ten dollars. It's under, uh, it's in a reasonable price category where people would consider purchasing it. So, yeah, um, you know, the cheaper, the more affordable you make it, then, um, you know, maybe the quality is not so good. When should software be covered under copyright law? That's a very good question. Uh, it is. Should it continue to be? That's another problem. So, And then the GNU public licenses and alternatives for proprietary software for today's current legal framework. Does it really work? Yeah, I think it does. Um, so, Issues for software developers, patents for software. You can't patent software. You can copy protect it, but you can't patent it. Patent protection inventions new things or processes. So the Supreme Court said that software could not be patented uh, however, a machine that included the software could. Okay, that's weird. Patents are not supposed to be given to things that are obvious or already in common use. Um, yeah, the patent office has made mistakes and continues to make mistakes. Um, but it doesn't. It does not provide patents for software. Maybe for hardware, but not software. So patents on web technologies, uh, Amazon agreed to pay IBM, who holds patents for online catalog catalogs and targeted marketing. Microsoft was fined $1.5 billion for violating MP3 patents. Um, yeah, the case is still not over with that. Friendster applied for a patent on its social network. While the patent was pending, sites at MySpace sprung up. Friendster patent was granted. And hmm, they may now charge a license. Well, that would include Facebook. So, actually, Facebook does pay a royalty to Friendster, who does own the patent on social networking. Uh, so that that is that is still around. So that is everything you ever probably didn't want to know about intellectual property in Chapter Four. Uh, and this sort of concludes um, the lecture that you would have had on Monday. Um, this coming up Monday, um, I kind of gave it, recorded it early, uh, so that you could have it available. Um, I will do another lecture for this week, uh, that will be for Wednesday's lecture. Um, stay tuned for more, um, online lecture. This lecture replaces the in-class lecture that you would have received live. Um, if you have questions, it's really difficult to ask them right now. Um, so... You know, send me an email, um, hit me up and we can set a time. We could talk about, um, assignments. We can talk about anything you need to talk about. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the lecture and stay tuned for, uh, more, more to come. And, uh, I will hopefully keep you informed and you can keep me informed if you have an issue or problem and I will see you for the next class meeting. Thanks for watching.